On Monday night, I began by looking at uh, Nahum 1.7, uh, one of a couple of verses uh, in Nahum that is positive in nature, and we examined some of the main words uh, in that beautiful verse. And one of the things that we discovered uh, is that Nahum's name, along with Noah's name, uh, stem uh, from a root word that is translated as comfort or repent. And this is Strong's number 5162. And of course, both men are involved uh, uniquely in their own uh, context of judgment, the flood for Noah and also the judgment on Nineveh with regard to Nahum. And of course, I mentioned this has great bearing on us today. Uh, on Tuesday night, last night, we considered some of the verses that contain uh, this word, uh, 5162, comfort or repent. And we also focused on a couple other words in Genesis 5, 29. One of those was toil, and the other is work. Uh, to try to understand their relationship to comfort, and we saw in the process that man's works for salvation are absolutely futile. And only the work of Christ that was accomplished uh, before the foundation of the world was the only means of genuine salvation. Uh, tonight, I'd like to take this a step further uh, in order to examine the connection uh, between the word work, work, and the various elements that we find in the temple. And of course, these different elements or furnishings also point to Christ. Uh, and in this, I think we'll see uh, some of the beautiful harmony of God's word that is uh, unequaled in perfection and, and in its beauty. And of course, it's designed to exalt the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we have to keep that in mind as we approach the scriptures. It's all about him. He's the, the main focal point of everything. And so I'd like us to investigate uh, Exodus 26, and we're going to look at three verses only, uh, verse 1, verse 31, and then verse 36. And uh, this particular passage contains this uh, term, work, but also we're going to look at 12 other words, uh, Lord willing, uh, that comprise some of the elements or furnishings in the temple. Uh, one of them is going to be curtains. And we will find this word uh, in connection to uh, our universe, which is expanding. But spiritually, this word has to do with the advancement of the gospel uh, during the day of salvation, and in particular, uh, during the latter rain. Uh, the second word is going to be the veil, that giant carpet that hung down from the ceiling to the floor and separated the Holy of Holies from the rest uh, of the tabernacle, and spiritually illustrates Christ's flesh being torn from top to bottom uh, in the atonement, again, prior to creation. Uh, number three, uh, and hanging or covering that we find used uh, uh, not only in front of the, the door, but also these coverings were used to cover the altar and some of the other uh, uh, furniture uh, within the tabernacle itself. Number four is the door, and of course Christ is the door, uh, of fine twined linen, which is indicative of the righteousness of Christ, that the elect have been clothed with. Uh, number six, the color blue, which was the color of the cloth that God instructed uh, the Jews to wear on the, uh, the hem of their garments. And that was designed to remind them of the word of God. Uh, 
the color purple, number seven, uh, typifying the hair of the bride of Christ, we're going to find in one particular passage. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the bride typified uh, as the wife, uh, she is to be in subjection to her husband. In other words, the elect are in subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bridegroom. He is our husband. Uh, number eight is the word scarlet, which is Strong's number 8144. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it has two parts to this. One is 8144. The other is 8438. 8144 pictures salvation as well as hope. And uh, scarlet is the same word, tola, that Chris spoke about, a worm. And we see that Christ became a worm in the atonement. He was under the wrath of God. Uh, number 10 are the cherubims that uh, look down upon the mercy seat within the Holy of Holies. And it was from off of that mercy seat that we find some passages where God uh, spoke. And so it has to do with the word of God. Uh, number 11 is of cunning, of cunning work. And this particular word has to do, again, with salvation, but also with judgment. And lastly, number 12 is needlework, uh, which uh, is a, a beautiful word because it represents the formation of, of the body of Christ as a baby in the womb, as we saw in Psalm 139. But I'll begin just by reading uh, Exodus 26, 1, 31, and 36, in which this word for work, which is Strong's number 46, 39, is rendered wrought. Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains, of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. 31, and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work. With cherubims shall it be made. Uh, number 36, and thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen wrought, this is that same word, again, work, with needlework. Uh, you'll notice that the phrase fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet is repeated. These are the same words in each of the places where it's repeated. And I'll begin with curtains which is Strong's number 3407. And we find this term, uh, for example, in Psalm 104, verse 2. Uh, like a curtain is the way it's rendered. And this is speaking about God himself, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain. And apparently scientists tell us that the universe is expanding, and so we see how when God made the universe, that was he built into it. God, of course, himself is the light. When there was no timekeepers, God said, let there be light because he is the light. And of course, we know that in the new heavens and new earth, there's not going to be a need for a timekeeper, because God himself is going to be that eternal light that will lighten the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, we see a little different picture in Isaiah 54, 2, which speaks of this spiritual expansion, which I mentioned. Uh, particularly during the latter reign as the gospel went out with great uh, power and, and uh, great uh, a blessing to reach the nations of the elect uh, before God shut the door. Uh, during that very lengthy 
time and season, uh, 13,023 years. Um, it's amazing when we think about that anybody who says, you know, you know, salvation is still possible or why isn't it still happening today need to be reminded of that fact that God was tremendously merciful uh, during that very lengthy time and season. And then on May 21, 2011, the temple was completed and all of the bricks, so to speak, were in place. Uh, enlarge the place of thy tent. And remember, the tabernacle is a tent. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. And so the, as God brought in his elect over those 13,023 years, the tent had to be enlarged, the, 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 the stakes, the cords, all of that, uh, uh, to carry the analogy, had to expand in order to keep all these people uh, that uh, were the elect of God. Now, we also see where this uh, tabernacle is pointing to the destruction of uh, uh, Israel in the first instance and the churches and denominations, uh, secondly, in Jeremiah 10.20. Here it speaks about God's tabernacle being spoiled or robbed and the cords uh, being broken, emphasizing the fact that judgment first began at the house of God, and then, uh, as of May 21, 2011, we entered into this prolonged day of judgment. Um, we can also, there's another interesting passage uh, having to do with uh, God's judgment in Ezekiel 9, 6. Um, Uh, 6 and 7. Uh, uh, actually, I can start with verse 5. And to the other he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, and he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth, and they went forth, and slew in the city. Um, we also see uh, God's judgment in uh, Jeremiah 49, 29. Their tents and their flocks shall they take away. They shall take to themselves their curtains and all their vessels and their camels, and they shall cry unto them, Fear is on every side. Uh, the second word we want to take a look at is the word veil. Uh, in uh, Exodus 26, uh, 31, and uh, we uh, see numerous examples of this. Uh, for example, in uh, Exodus 26, 31, it says, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Uh, also in Leviticus 16.2, And Jehovah said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil. And veil is 65.32. Before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Uh, also, you know, in thinking about uh, this term veil, if we go to the New Testament, uh, we read in Mark 15, 38, 
and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And this ve word veil is, is uh, V-E-I-L. The other one in the Old Testament is V-A-I-L. Uh, and V-E-I-L is Strong's number 2665. Now, it's interesting because we know that the Lord uh, is the word made flesh. We read that in John 1.14. But we find an amazing statement in Hebrews 10, uh, 19 to 20. It says there, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So it's interesting that it speaks about Christ, uh, the veil being torn from top to bottom, and yet it's comparing that to Christ's flesh. And I think the only way we can understand that, at least for me at this point, is before the foundation of the world. Because when he was on the cross, his flesh was not ripped in half. Yes, he had the crown of thorns, he had the nails, he had the, 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 the spear that pierced his side. And, and so I think this is referring to what happened uh, at the foundation of the world where he was annihilated. He had become God's enemy. He was under the curse of God. Uh, and he had to die, he had to be annihilated, and of course, he rose uh, from the dead. Um, uh, number three is an hanging. Uh, this is Strong's number 4539, and this would be another kind of covering that was used uh, within the tabernacle, and it's uh, normally always translated this way um, uh, in, in the tabernacle. There are uh, a couple places where it, the, the, the subject is a little different. Uh, it's not in the tabernacle per se, and one of those is in uh, 2 Samuel 17.1. And here we read, and this had to do with uh, when Absalom were, was, you know, trying to usurp the, David's authority and that whole thing was going on. And Jonathan and another man uh, were in hiding and they went uh, to try to hide uh, from some of Absalom's men and they uh, went inside of a well and this woman uh, took a covering over the well and then tried to cover it up with gr uh, ground corn so that it wouldn't seem like there was a well there. Uh, and the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread corn, excuse me, ground corn thereon, and the thing was not known that they were actually hiding inside this well. Uh, also, in Psalm 105, we find another historical parable. Uh, here, uh, this had to do with Israel uh, during their 40-year sojourn uh, uh, in the desert uh, as they were going toward the Promised Land. Uh, and here, uh, we see that this term covering had to do with the cloud uh, by day uh, as well as the pillar of fire by night. And we know that both of those represent the word of God in guiding them, uh, whether it be by day or whether it was at night. Uh, he spread a cloud for a covering. Uh, that's our word, 4539, and fire to give light in the night. If you remember when the Egyptians were pursuing them, they, they could not get close enough to them because God didn't allow them to see. He, 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 he had the cloud there so that they couldn't, they couldn't see where they were, and so that way they kept ahead of them. Um, number four is the door, which is Strong's number 6607. And 
this is primarily rendered as entry or gate or entrance. And of course, we recognize that Christ is the door. Uh, John 10, 7 says, uh, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. We also find uh, this same word in connection with Noah uh, as he was building the, the ark. In Genesis 6:16, 6, uh, we find this description. Uh, a window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And of course, we understand that God on the 17th day of the second month shut that door after Noah and his family went in and and they, then they were the only ones that were saved. Everyone else on planet Earth perished. Uh, also, if we go to Exodus 12, uh, 22 and 23, uh, we find this word door, 6607, mentioned uh, with regard to the Passover and the instruction that God gave the Israelites of what they were to do that, that night. And he says, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For Jehovah will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, and on the two side posts, Jehovah will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. We also find this uh, same word uh, in this uh, beautiful passage in Psalm 24, 7 th uh, through 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? Jehovah, strong and mighty. Jehovah, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? Jehovah of hosts, he is the king of glory. The uh, next, uh, there are actually two words of fine twined and linen. Uh, fine twined is 7806 and linen is 8336. And as I mentioned, we find this particular term along with the, the blue and the scarlet and the purple uh, three times there, the, we find these together. And these were uh, used, uh, th these materials, these colors, were used in the fabrication of not only the curtains, but also the veil, the hanging for the door of the tent, the hangings for the court, the hangings for the gate of the court, along with the ephod, which the high priest wore, and the curious girdle, and the breastplate of judgment, along with the mitre, or which, which was a head covering, uh, and also goodly bonnets and breeches that the priests wore as well, uh, both Aaron as well as his sons. But, you know, when we go to the New Testament, we also find that God gives us a description of what fine linen refers to, in Revelation 19, 8 and 14. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, 
clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And here the Greek word for fine linen is Strong's number 1039. Uh, the next word, number six, is blue, which is uh, 8504. And uh, we find uh, this command that God gives in Numbers 15, uh, 38 to 41. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon, which is also translated as lace, a ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Jehovah to, and to do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart, and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am Jehovah your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Jehovah your God. And in thinking about this, I was reminded about the uh, account in the New Testament in Matthew 9, 20 to 22, regarding the healing of the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And we know that it was not so much her faith, but the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is that she wanted to touch not only his garment, but also the hem of his garment. And that had to do with, if we, if we go back to Numbers 15, with the fact that there was this fringe, this, this border, this lace at the bottom of the garment in blue, which re, was to remind the Israelites of the commandments. In, in essence, what she was doing is she was touching that as if to say, I can be healed by the commandments of God, by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, the next word, number seven, is purple, and this is uh, Strong's number 713. We find this uh, in Proverbs 31, 22, for instance, uh, in this affirmation re regarding the virtuous woman. And the virtuous woman uh, pictures uh, the elect. Uh, she typifies uh, all the elect. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. And in, in the New Testament, uh, we also uh, see where the color purple is associated with uh, royalty. Uh, for example, in, um, oh, I forgot that reference. Um, all right, let's skip that. Song of Solomon 7, 5. Uh, we read there, thine head upon thee is like Carmel, and the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. So here, the, the head of the bride is, is likened to this word purple. And of course, if we read uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 3, 7, and 15, we see the spiritual picture of the bridegroom under the authority of the bridegroom, uh, or the bride under the authority of the bridegroom. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. 
and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So again, we, we see this uh, relationship of submission, the, uh, just like uh, Eve typifying the elect was to be in submission to Adam, typifying Christ in the same way all of the elect are to be in submission uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is typified by uh, this color purple. And so, uh, you know, as we, we think about um, these various items, you know, in relationship to the temple, uh, we're, we begin to see uh, uh, various pictures that, that come forth. Uh, uh, the uh, number eight, uh, is uh, scarlet. As I said, it has two words. Uh, the first one is 8144. Uh, it's uh, Shani. And um, we find that, uh, for example, in Proverbs 3121, again, uh, another reference to the bride of Christ. Here it says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. There's also uh, a, a very interesting um, account having to do with uh, Rahab the harlot when she, uh, you know, hid the spies and then the spies told her, you need to put a scarlet line uh, outside of your window so that we know that, you know, this is your house and you're going to be spared. And, and everyone that you want spared needs to be inside of your house and we'll know this you know by this scarlet line uh, and this is uh, Joshua 2 18 and 21 behold when we come into the land thou shalt bind this line of scarlet uh, thread in the window which thou didst let us down by and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother, and thy brethren, and the, all thy father's household home unto thee. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window. So not only were they let down by this scarlet line, which was probably pretty sturdy, I would imagine, as like a rope or something, in order for them to get down. But what's interesting, be, besides the word scarlet that's used here, is the word line. And the word line is uh, Strong's number 8615. And the reason uh, I, I bring this up is because uh, Except in these uh, two citations uh, here in Joshua uh, 2, 18 and 21, this word for line is always translated as hope or expectation. Uh, in Proverbs 23, 18, it's, it's rendered as and thine expectation. For surely there is an end and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Now, the number nine is this word, Tola, uh, 8438. And uh, again, we see uh, in Job 25, four to six, uh, where this is used. How then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even, the, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. And this last one is 
uh, Tola, 8438. Uh, we also see in Isaiah 66, 24, uh, God's judgment. And of course, we know that not only did it fall upon Christ, uh, because he was bearing the sins of the elect at the foundation of the world, but also this is going to be the lot of all of the non-elect. Uh, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And so we see the, uh, the end result, the wages of sin is death uh, and annihilation. And this is what unsaved man, the non-elect, have to look forward to. That is their fate, and that cannot never be changed. Uh, now that we've entered into the day of judgment, they are just awaiting. They've been sentenced, and they're just awaiting like, like somebody on death row. They're waiting for the execution to take place. Uh, psalm 22.6 is another uh, messianic psalm, and here uh, we see Christ as a worm, as Tola. Uh, but I am a worm, and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people. He had to undergo what man by nature, unsaved man by nature, has to face, which again is death and annihilation. They will never see light. They will never see life. They will never see the, the kingdom of God because they are not part of the kingdom of God. They remained part of this world, part of Satan's kingdom. And the only thing that Satan's kingdom can offer is death and darkness. That is the essence of, of his kingdom. It's the very exact opposite of the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of truth, of light, of love, uh, and because that is just some of the characteristics of God himself. Uh, we could be here for a million years talking about all the characteristics of God that make up, you know, his eternal, infinite nature, and we could never exhaust uh, those attributes they are, each one is so wonderful that we could spend eternity just focusing on one aspect, much less all the other infinite aspects that are part of his nature. And then to think that we can be married to God and to inherit everything that he is, and that becomes ours by, by reason of this marriage. Uh, and it's just beyond uh, anything that we can possibly even begin to imagine. And we know the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those who love him. And the only reason we love him is because he first loved us. It started with him. It started before creation. Um, the next uh, term, number 10, is the cherubims. Uh, and uh, their location above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, where God would speak from time to time. For example, in Numbers 7, 89, we learn, And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation, to speak with him, that is, with God. Then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of testimony, from between the two cherubims. And he spake unto him. And this word cherubims is Strong's number 3742. We also see this expressed in Hezekiah's prayer in 2 Kings 19.15. Uh, 
And Hezekiah prayed before Jehovah and said, O Jehovah, God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Uh, one last passage is in Psalm 80, uh, verse 1. Again, another beautiful uh, scripture. To the chief musician upon Shoshanimaduth, a psalm of Asaph. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. So we see the identification uh, here uh, with the word of God itself as well. Uh, number 11 is of cunning. Uh, speaking of the, the, the work, the, the craftsmanship on a physical level, but it's, it's actually much more than that. This is a word, 2803, that uh, is very pregnant with meaning. Uh, and here are some of the ways that God uh, utilizes this term in Genesis 15, 6, which is a passage that is very often misunderstood it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ being imputed or given to Abraham for righteousness. And it's rendered as, and he counted. This word cunning is the same word, and he counted. And he believed in Jehovah. And he counted it, uh, or him, for righteousness. In other words, Christ was counted or imputed to Abraham for righteousness. Christ is our the righteousness of the believers, of the saints. Uh, we also similarly see this word rendered as esteemed or esteemed twice in Isaiah 53, 3 to 4. And again, in this magnificent chapter that really speaks about the atonement at the foundation of the world. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Just like that beautiful hymn, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. And I think it's in the third verse of that, of that hymn where he says uh, something to the effect that the, the greatest stroke was the stroke that justice, with a capital J, Gave. In other words, it was God the Father that poured out his wrath upon God the Son. We cannot understand that at all. It's just way beyond how could God do that to himself, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is eternal God. And yet, if he had not done that, you and I wouldn't be here. There would be no believers, okay, because that is the essence of, of our salvation is what Christ accomplished. He had to do that. And so when we see in the garden where may the cup pass from me, and he goes, you know, if, if, if I can't, if the cup can't pass unless I drink it, so be it. Thy will be done. And that's a only a demonstration. But that's exactly what he did he voluntarily gave his life because the shedding of blood, like we read in Leviticus 17.11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. In Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins. And so that was what Christ went through on behalf of each of the elect. 
we also see this uh, in Job 33.10, where we find this word uh, counted or cunning. Uh, here it's rendered as he counteth. Behold, he, this is God, findeth occasions against me. Speaking of Christ, Job is a tremendous picture of Christ as, as uh, Guy has done in his wonderful study on the book of Job. He counteth me for his enemy. And that word enemy is Strong's number 341, identically spelled as the root word, which is 340. And 340 is also the root word for Job. Okay? Job means enemy. Christ, in the person of Job, or typified by Job, became the enemy of God in the atonement. He became a curse. And as a curse, like we read, anyone that dieth on a tree is cursed. And that's exactly what had to happen. Uh, and that was at the foundation of the world because that was the only time that Christ was bearing sin. He was not bearing sin on the cross. It was a demonstration. There was tremendous agony and pain, I'm sure physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, okay, because he's going through the motions, and we can't forget that. It, there wasn't a light deal at all, but it wasn't payment for sin. That had already taken place. Um, we can also look at Malachi uh, 3.16, uh, another beautiful passage concerning the elect. And here, uh, this word 2803 is translated uh, as, and that thought. Then they that feared Jehovah spake often one to another. And the Lord and Jehovah hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Jehovah and that thought upon his name. So here we see what the elect are interested in. They're interested in thinking about the scriptures. They're interested in meditating on the scriptures. They're interested in studying the scriptures and reading the scriptures and talking about the scriptures. And the reason for that is very simple. We find it in Deuteronomy 32, 46 to 47. Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. I'll start with verse 45. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to Israel. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whither you go over Jordan to possess it. The last term, number 12, we want to look at is this word uh, with needlework. A needlework is 7551, and it's also rendered as embroiderer, and we find it in connection with the gate of the court. This would be in Exodus 2716, the girdle uh, in Exodus 2839, and the hanging for the tabernacle door. And that's in Exodus 36, 37. But what's exceptionally beautiful about this word needlework is that we see it again in Psalm 139, verse 15. And here it's curiously wrought. 
Uh, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Uh, in light of the fact that the needlework is a picture, a spiritual picture of the formation of the body of Christ, uh, typified by the formation of this baby in the womb, we are just awestruck by the abundance of this word that is found in a number of uh, different places uh, or a number of different uh, elements in the temple. But all of these, and, and I've only gone through three verses, there are literally dozens and dozens of other verses that talk about other uh, furnishings in the temple, the candlestick, you have the altar, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the lamps, uh, there's so many other things that we could look at, uh, time doesn't permit us to, but it's almost as if in all of this God is like putting little sticky notes throughout the temple, so to speak, to, and I know that's a bad analogy, but to remind us of his nature, of his grace, of his mercy, uh, of his atonement that he made, and all of this is on display within the temple. And, you know, there's a rhetorical question that he poses in Isaiah uh, 49, 15 to 16, and I'll close with this. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And we read this very soft response that God gives, but it carries a tremendous weight. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me, and walls have to do with salvation. Uh, shall we pray?